Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our Northern Light Health Good Health is Good Business Zoom conference. We are currently seeing a mixed picture of Omicron across the country. Some areas are improving and some are worsening. Another booster has become available for those at high risk for severe illness. The timing of this availability is likely due to public health concerns of possible widespread increases of Omicron in the coming weeks. Today, we'll update the status of COVID-19 and then take a deep look at the delay of care that has taken place due to the pandemic. The more people understand what negative impacts delay of care can have, the more we will limit the undesirable consequences of poor health and earlier death. Our experts today will explore this issue across primary care, heart care, and cancer care. Our hope is that you share this information widely amongst your employees, your friends and family, and your communities at large. I'm Dr. Ed Gilkey, Senior Physician Executive at Northern Light Beacon Health. I'll be your moderator for the next hour. Our panelists today are Dr. Sue Ann Hammond, Primary Care Lead Physician at Northern Light Primary Care in Wyndham. Dr. Thomas Earle, an interventional cardiologist at Northern Light Cardiology. Stephanie Basse, a certified nurse practitioner at Northern Light Cancer Care. Dr. Jim Jarvis, Director of Clinical Education at Northern Light Eastern Maine Medical Center and Senior Physician Executive of COVID-19 Incident Command at Northern Light Health. Before we get started, I will read our legal disclosure. The coronavirus pandemic is an ongoing, continuously evolving situation. Northern Light Health encourages everyone to follow federal and state governmental guidance and mandates. Northern Light Health does not know the particulars of your situation, so the information presented today is general in nature and is based upon Northern Light Health's own experience, which may or may not apply in your specific situation, and which may be revised as we learn more about the coronavirus. Accordingly, following any guidance Northern Light Health presents today in no way guarantees that you, your employees, and or your customers and clients will not contract or spread the coronavirus. A reminder, this hour is for you. If at any time you have a question for our panelists, please use the Q&A function. I'll keep track of your questions and have our speakers respond. Also, I hope each of you will take a few minutes immediately following this hour to answer our quick five question survey. Your input directly affects our topics and helps guide our future conferences. Dr. Jarvis will start us off with the latest on COVID-19. Dr. Jarvis? Thank you, Ed. Uh, first slide, please. So this is the, the uh, CDC's community risk level map. And you can see that in Maine, all of our counties now are considered in the low risk category. And in fact, if you look across New England, most counties across all of New England are also in that low risk category. But what does that risk actually mean? When we're talking about community risk, there are a lot of factors uh, that are taken into consideration. First is, uh, how many positive test results are we seeing? That's a little bit confusing right now because many people now have access to home tests and often will test at home and therefore they don't have a record of what actually happens, whether that's a negative or a positive test. The biggest thing that it takes into consideration is community resources and whether or not there are open beds available for people who have severe disease who need to come into a hospital and get treatment there and what treatment options are available at those local hospitals. One of the confusing measures with that is that it really only takes into account COVID hospitalizations and not overall hospitalizations. And as we've talked about in this forum before, uh, the state of Maine always has uh, capacity issues, um, regardless of whether we're dealing with a pandemic or not, because we just don't have enough acute care beds to um, meet the demands of our community across the state of Maine. And we have too few long-term care beds for people who no longer need to be in the hospital, but are not ready or unable to go home. And so it does make this a little bit confusing, especially as we go into the next slide, please, which is actually the community transmission level. And so though this, gra this graphic looks better than what we've shown over the last couple of weeks, 
um, it still shows that most of Maine continues to have significant spread of coronavirus within our communities. And if we look at Aroostook County, it has even higher spread, and that's been pretty consistent during most of the last four months. Um, and so we do know that there is a virus out there and the virus is spreading. The CDC, the Maine CDC recently set up an alert that we should be prepared that we may be looking at an increase, possibly a blip, possibly a spike, possibly a wave, or even a surge of coronavirus cases in the state of Maine. Those indicators, one, come from the fact that we have had a pretty stable level of virus uh, across the state of Maine for a good amount of time now, where many other parts of the country have continued to see their viral loads going down. Also, the state of Maine participates in the federal CDC's wastewater surveillance system, where in several of our larger communities, wastewater is monitored for viral elements. And we have seen a significant increase in those viral elements here in the state of Maine. Massachusetts has seen something similar. We've also seen case counts rising across New England, particularly due to the BA2 variant of the Omicron um, variant of the, of the coronavirus. And so this is another word of caution that we need to remain vigilant. We need to continue to do those protective measures that we've talked about during the pandemic, and that vaccination is still key for us to getting things under control. So let's take a look about where we are with vaccinations right now. Next slide. So it, some, some people are still confused about vaccines and I'll tell you, sometimes I'm confused as well. And so we'll kind of go over this uh, step by step. So right now the primary series, which includes either two messenger RNAs, either the Pfizer or Moderna, or one Johnson & Johnson vaccine, everyone over the age of five is recommended to receive that, um, that primary series. People who are immunocompromised should receive an additional dose, whether that be a third dose of the messenger RNA or a second dose of Johnson & Johnson, or if they received one dose of Johnson & Johnson, having their second dose be a messenger RNA. So their primary series would be more shots. The first booster shot that we talked about uh, is now recommended for anyone over the age of 12, and they should receive it as a messenger RNA vaccine. Um, it is not considered good to do booster shots with the Johnson & Johnson. They should be receiving this at least five months after they receive their messenger RNA, or if they receive Johnson & Johnson as their primary series, only two months they should receive a booster shot. That's for booster shot number one. Next slide, please. Booster shot number two is a little bit more confusing, and that's where we're going to try to uh, tease this out a little bit. First and foremost, it should be received uh, at least four months after the first booster dose has been received. Currently, the federal CDC and the main CDC recommend that anyone over the age of 65 should receive an additional messenger RNA dose. And that's pretty clear cut and based on some evidence from other countries and including some data here in the United States that shows that people who are over the age of 65 that their immunity to the first booster dose has started to wane after about four months and that they would get better protection, particularly during this uh, uh, BA2 wave um, for uh, preventing hospitalization and death. But anyone who had received two doses of Johnson & Johnson, regardless of age, should consider getting a booster shot from a messenger RNA dose. And that's because, again, immunity from the, from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, wanes much more quickly than we've seen with either of the two messenger RNA vaccines. Anyone who is age over 50 should also consider getting an additional dose. But this is really based upon risk. Do you have any other health uh, conditions that may put you at higher risk for uh, contracting the virus or having severe disease from the virus? Do you work in an occupation where you come in contact with many other individuals throughout the day from the community? And what community spread is like within your particular community? Which, as I said, here in Maine, we still have significant community spread, even though our risk level is low. And then anyone who is age 12 or older who is immunocompromised should also consider an additional uh, messenger RNA dose uh, as a second booster shot. You may want to consult with your primary care provider or those that are treating you for whatever that underlying immunocompromised uh, condition is, uh, whether the vaccine is right for you. Next slide, please. So getting your second booster shot at Northern Light Health. Currently, people are eligible for, this, for the booster is limited to, as I just said, um, right now, we have no intentions of, of starting up large-scale vaccination clinics, but that's certainly something we could do if necessary. Right now, all of our retail pharmacies um, in the Northern Light Health System are accepting uh, people to do walk-in appointments during regular business hours and on after-hours and weekends. We can do this by appointment. 
And then starting this Friday, we hope that all of our primary care offices will also be able to administer a second booster dose. They can do that right now with a direct physician's order. However, uh, once we get in place uh, all of our computer systems on Friday, uh, it will be a much more easy process for people to get their vaccination at their primary care locations. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Ed. Well, thanks, Jim. Uh, if you would just stay on for a minute. Um, I wanted to make a comment that uh, with this boosters, you know, it is a bit confusing. Um, personally, I've received uh, three doses of Pfizer and my booster number two was a Moderna. So I'll share that with our audience. Uh, but, I, but I have a question here from our audience. If one J&J and mRNA booster received, is an additional mRNA booster needed? Uh, currently, it is not. It would be that would then be considered your second booster shot, and so then it really comes down to your individual risk. So, if you're over age 65, I would recommend that you do go ahead and receive a second messenger RNA, which would be your second booster shot. And if you're immunocompromised, I would also consider that strongly. If you're over the age of 50 and you're relatively good health and you're not really put in a risky situation, meaning that you're not in an occupation that puts you in contact with lots of other people, it may be something that you may want to wait on, you may want to uh, defer, or you may want to talk to your primary care provider about that. So, so Jim, I, ha I have another question. You know, I think, I think in the course of everybody kind of dealing with this pandemic, and clearly, we all have had enough of it. It's like, oh, gosh, enough with this. And, and you touched on it with the transmission uh, data. Um, I wanted to just kind of walk through a little bit with you leading up to just kind of touching on Omicron XE out there ultimately. So when we think about the original coronavirus, COVID-19, and then Delta, Delta was more contagious or higher transmission, correct? Correct. And then, and then the next thing we saw was this Omicron somewhere around the uh, end of November, and it was BA1 that we were hearing about. So was that more transmissible? It's still a little bit unclear whether it was more transmissible than the Delta. It certainly was much more transmissible than any of the original strains that we mm -hmm. talked about in the first year of the pandemic. Um, and it may not have caused as severe disease as we saw with Delta, but because it was so widespread, we certainly saw just the same number of people who were getting sick. Mm -hmm. And so, so then BA1 was the subvariant that we've been hearing about for quite a while that was uh, the prominent one across the country. I think now we're at virtually 100% of all infections are with some version of Omicron. Now, now we're dealing with BA2. And that sounds like it's a bit more transmissible than even BA1. It does. And some of that may be that it, it, has, it is evading some of our early uh, vaccinations. So meaning not that the vaccinations have changed, but those people who received their vaccines very early on in our vaccination process who have not yet received booster shots, that because of their waning immunity and some slight differences between the BA1 mm -hmm. and the BA2 variant of Omicron, uh, it, can, it seems to evade that a little bit more. And we've seen that in the news when we certainly talked about an increase in what we call breakthrough cases, meaning that individuals who have had prior infections or have been vaccinated uh, continue to still get infected again. And so, uh, but we haven't seen that as much with people who have received the first booster dose. And this is really the concern and the reason why this, the, the FDA initially authorized authorized a second booster dose, and then the CDC approved a second booster dose was because we're starting to see some waning immunity from people who had received their first booster dose now more than four months out. And so, yes, it does look like BA2 is probably um, at least more, I will, you know, spreads a little bit more easily. I won't say that it's more transmissible, um, and that's simply because of, of probably waning immunity and the amount of virus that's out there in our communities. Mm. So, so uh, a number of sessions ago, we talked about uh, Delta Cron, and I, I made the statement that uh, we're not going to worry about Delta Cron. But interestingly, we're seeing now this Omicron XE. Um, it, there's actually some report in the United States as well, just a few cases, but we're seeing it elsewhere in the world, which is really the recombination of BA1 and BA2, you know, almost like the best of or the worst of the two subvariants of Omicron. Um, do you see that as potentially an issue for us in this country? So, of course, there's always that potential, but right now we don't consider that to be an issue for us. So the United Kingdom right now is actually uh, one of their highest peaks 
of overall infections that they've had during the entire pandemic. And it's still unclear why that happened at the United Kingdom. Um, and they're seeing kind of a mixture there of the BA2 variant and the BXE variant. And, uh, and so it's hard to tease that out. But mm -hmm. here in the United States, where one BA2 has not caused a significant disease as we've seen other places, still have to remain cautious about that. Um, similarly, we think that about uh, this, new, this newer variant. Also, the World Health Organization has not listed that particular subvariant as a, as a variant of interest or a variant of concern. And until that happens, um, I think right now it's not something that really we need to be concerned about immediately here at the United, in the United States, certainly something that we need to continue to watch. Mm. So, so I, I, I think I'm hearing uh, this is not over. Vaccinations are really important, and so are boosters. Yeah, and yesterday the FDA had its, its independent advisory council talk about what's the future of vaccines. And basically what they came down to was, we don't know yet. We still, uh, this coronavirus is just acting so differently than we've had with other respiratory viruses, certainly differently than the way influenza typically acts each year, and definitely uh, different than the way coronaviruses typically um, uh, show up during historical times. And so uh, with all of that, we just don't know. Um, and so there's more to come. Well, well, thanks, Jim. And, and I certainly encourage our participants to keep asking questions and uh, we'll ask Dr. Jarvis as it goes along. So thank you. Thank you, Ed. I'll now set the stage for today's topic. Delay of care is a concern because intuitively, we know delays can cause missed screening and the chance for early diagnosis for diseases that specifically are best treated early. It also means chronic diseases are more likely to progress faster. The impact can be a loss of years and loss of lives. Additionally, from a cost management perspective, these advanced disease states cost more. Data is currently being collected to understand what this really means. While our intuition and educated guessing will be very close, it's the data that will define the negative impacts of these first two years of delayed care. I've listed a few of the causes of delayed care on the slide. These causes will need consideration as we tailor solutions. Having said that, every solution will have in common the need to engage and inform the public. So far, I've shared the guesses. Now, let's take a look at what we know. In the early months of the pandemic, 50% of all Americans delayed care. A year into the pandemic in 2021, still 28% of Americans over the age of 50 delayed care. When we look at primary care, there's a difference in rescheduling appointments with unvaccinated people at 53% compared to vaccinated at 85%. Even that final 15% of the vaccinated group is a problem. Let's think about chronic diseases for a moment. The CDC reports six out of 10 people in the US are affected by a chronic disease and four out of 10 have two or more. Those are staggering numbers and we quickly come to appreciate the likely impact of those delay numbers I shared earlier. Shifting gears to emergency care. A reference is provided on the slide that shows that heart-related fatalities increased in 2020 due to people delaying calling 911 for fear of having to go to the hospital and presumably a place where the coronavirus is. Let's also take a quick look at cancer. The British Medical Journal reports that even a four week delay in treating seven different cancers all result in more people dying. Just four weeks delay, that's a very sobering fact. Let's take a look at some of the early information coming in. This graphic shows the percent of breast cancer diagnosis in stage one, which is early local cancer, and stage four, which is late with spread to other parts of the body. We also know that as metastatic cancer. This is measured across three years. Clearly, the early stage is being diagnosed less frequently and the late stage more frequently during the pandemic. This is not good. 
On this next slide, a model was developed to anticipate what this means. It includes breast cancer and colorectal cancer, which together account for nearly one sixth of all cancers and are most aligned with the benefits of early diagnosis. We see in this model that during the next few years, people will die from these diseases that under our pre-pandemic care delivery wouldn't have. By 2030, we'll be seeing an excess accumulation of 10,000 people who will die due to these two diseases alone, all because of delay of care. This is still partially preventable. Two years of damage is done, but if we catch up, we can lessen the number of these excess deaths. On this next slide are some things each of us can do. Delay of care is truly the beginning of the post-pandemic pandemic. It is a major public health issue that each of us can help to address. We need to share information and have discussions. Why is all of this important? Because improved management of diseases leads to better outcomes for people. An earlier diagnosis leads to greater treatment options and better outcomes. And managing now leads to lower cost of care, lower insurance costs, and most importantly, helping people to live better, longer lives. For this next segment, Dr. Hammond will look at primary care. Dr. Hammond? Good, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Gilkey, for having me. Um, as Dr. Gilkey mentioned, I'm a primary care provider. I've been practicing family medicine for the past 15 years. And my um, time with you today is really quite easy because it's what the primary, what your primary care providers and what primary care providers are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, everyone may know that you can reach out and call to be seen for an illness, a sore throat, an injury, um, to discuss something. But also with primary care, we're doing chronic disease management. So we're seeing our patients for diabetes, we're seeing patients for respiratory illness, such as asthma, COPD, which is a, a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. We're seeing patients regularly for mental health concerns, um, depression, anxiety, grief, trauma. And if we look at the numbers uh, prior to the pandemic, there were 30, uh, almost 30 million office-based visits for diabetes alone. And when you look at diabetes as just being a contributing factor, that brings the number closer to 51 million visits. In 2012, um, 1.8 million emergency room visits happened for COPD, difficulty breathing. And of those patients presenting to the emergency room, 20% of them were admitted. In 2012 to 14, consistently over 30 million mental health related office visits per year by adults 18 and older. As we look at what we know for frequency of visits and compare that to where we, what, where we are and what happened during the pandemic, there was a significant decline in patients seeking care for chronic conditions, for complications, um, going to their primary care provider, and as you can see on the slide, seeking emergency room care. So immediately following the COVID-19 pandemic a declaration, there was a 23% decrease in patients going to the emergency room for heart-related chest pain, heart attack symptoms, 20% decrease in stroke symptoms, and a 10% decrease in uncontrolled high blood sugar. That didn't mean those problems went away. That means patients and people stayed home with high blood sugar. They stayed home with some atypical chest pain, um, which causes those conditions to actually become um, more serious and potentially more life-threatening. When you call your primary care provider, again, maybe you're gonna be seen for something like a sore throat, shoulder pain, an injury. Um, but more importantly, if you have a chronic disease, going to see your primary care provider gives that provider a chance to check your vital signs, to check your blood pressure, your heart rate, to order labs that are important uh, for screening for chronic diseases, as well as for the management of chronic diseases, and then screening diagnostics. When you see your primary care provider for a wellness visit, for a physical exam, that's a chance to look for any of those problems and get back to early detection. So getting your mammogram, your colon cancer screening test, getting your bone density test, getting your labs um, will help us determine uh, and find early conditions. Um, and if you do have a chronic condition, it helps us manage it appropriately. 
when you see your primary care provider, that gives you the chance to coordinate your treatments. That allows um, a referral to a nutritionist, a diabetic educator, a therapist, and it gives you a chance for patient education to really talk about your situation, your risks, your medical concerns uh, with your provider. If you don't have a primary care provider, there's certainly Northern Light Health locations from the top of the state to the bottom, 48 primary care locations, 20 specifically for pediatrics, and we have seven walk-in care locations. If there's something going on and you can't get into a new PCP soon enough, one of our walk-in care locations um, can take, uh, take you in that day and certainly help you get connected with the right person for follow-up care. And as Dr. Jarvis mentioned, um, we certainly have locations available for vaccinations. Um, and the next slide shows the um, uh, reference for you to be able to go on the internet um, and get information for any vaccine, COVID vaccine needs that you have. Thank you, Sue Ann. Dr. Earl will now provide insight into heart care. Dr. Earl? Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Gilkey. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'll start with a little bit of background here. Um, we can all harken back to about two years ago when the pandemic first hit. Um, you know, the community, we all had significant concerns about how we were going to continue delivering both, you know, chronic disease management care and uh, emergency care, you know, community members and people in the general population were concerned about going to the hospital uh, and potentially contracting the virus. Um, healthcare systems and providers were concerned about having adequate, an adequately staffed hospital. We didn't know if you know, large numbers of uh, staff members would be sick and ill and unable to work. And you know, finally, healthcare systems were concerned with having adequate personal protective equipment. Uh, and with the downstream delaying of routine care, procedures, healthcare screening, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. You know, and it turns out these concerns were, were, were not just theoretical. We, we saw this uh, happen in real time. You know, this is a busy slide here, but what this essentially shows is trends in hospitalizations uh, in the state of Massachusetts um, over time for various cardiovascular disease states. So these are common things like chest pain heart failure and stroke, um, uh, things that we take care of on a regular basis. And if you look towards the right of the screen, starting around mid-March of 2020, there was a fairly uh, abrupt uh, and significant decline in patients being hospitalized for, for these things, um, which corresponded to uh, an increase in uh, COVID-19 uh, infections in the state. Um, next slide, please. And you know, not only did we see a decrease in hospitalizations for the for these uh, common cardiovascular um, uh, diseases, we also even more concerningly saw a, a substantial increase in mortality. So we saw people dying more of these things. Um, you know, our our assumption was that people uh, were not seeking care, and not because these disease states went away, of course. Um, we were concerned that pe people were just avoiding hospitalizations in general. Um, this data is from New York City. If you look, uh, especially on the left side, uh, the far left of the screen, uh, there's a column for ischemic heart disease. So again, th these are things like chest pain uh, syndromes, threatened heart attacks, heart attacks. Uh, the blue graph on the bottom of the screen is, is a mortality rate that was from 2019. So that was historical. And then if you look again, starting around mid-March into April, your risk of dying from these disease entities increased significantly. And you know, we postulate that it was because patients were not seeking care promptly um, because of the concerns we mentioned and kind of presenting to us later in the disease state and in a sicker state. Um, next slide, please. You know, then, then lastly, kind of one of the uh, more time sensitive uh, entities that we take care of um, in, in cardiology is, is uh, it's uh, known as a STEMI or ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Essentially, this is a, a major heart attack where uh, a major heart artery is blocked completely. Um, this needs to be recognized quickly and addressed quickly. Um, over the last 10 to 20 years, uh, various you know, societies have really emphasized the community members recognizing some of these heart attack symptoms and seeking care quickly. Um, with all the modern day therapies we have, the most important thing is recognizing these symptoms quickly and getting to medical care quickly so you can benefit from, th from these therapies. And what we see on the, the left-hand side, um, a substantial increase in 
the time from symptoms, so say chest pain starting, to being admitted to the hospital. And with that, correspondingly, we see on the right side an increased risk in mortality. So people uh, dying more frequently from these entities, presumably, again, because um, they were deeper into the disease state uh, with oftentimes irreversible heart muscle damage. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. So that really re-emphasizes re uh, all the things that can go wrong with delaying care, uh, including in emergency care. So thanks for that. Ms. Basse will look at this issue from the perspective of cancer care. Stephanie? Thank you, Dr. Gilkey, and um, welcome, everyone. Um, so cancer is a wide world public health issue. It is the second leading cause of death in the United States, the first being um, cardiac disease, which Dr. Earl just spoke about. However, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the diagnosing and treatment of cancer was hindered due to the reduction in the access of care, therefore resulting in a delay in both the diagnosis and treatment, which ultimately created an uptick in advanced dis stage diseases, as well as increased mortality. Now that most people have been vaccinated and all healthcare facilities have safety measures in place, we feel it is very safe for people to get their recommended cancer screenings that they may have delayed. Next slide, please. So why is healthcare screening so important? It is important because one out of two women and one out of three men will develop cancer in their lifetime. As um, Dr. Gilkey previously stated, the greatest influx in cancer in young, the younger adult population has been in breast and colon cancer. But there is good news. Since the use of mammography, we have had a 42% decrease in mortality since 2019. The American Cancer Society recommends that mammograms be completed yearly, although your primary care provider can order testing based on risk, such as family history. However, studies have shown that by po postponing mammography by one year increases the risk of developing interval cancers and more advanced diseases. Colorectal cancer is currently the third leading cause of cancer in the United States and the second most cause of cancer deaths. And over the last several years, this cancer has been increasing each year by 2% in younger people than 50. According to the CDC director, Tom, Frieden, there are currently more than 20 million adults in the United States who have not had colorectal screening and therefore may, be, um, may end up with cancer and die from this very preventable disease. With home screening tests such as Cologuard, in addition to standard colonoscopies, 30,000 people um, have had less colorectal colorectal cancers and have prevented 16,000 lives have been saved in a one five year history uh, period, excuse me. Next slide, please. Here is a list of cancer screening recommendations according to the United States Preventative Services Task Force. As you can see, the recommended cancer screenings start as young as 21 and continue to at least 76 years depending on age um, preference and risk. Next slide. This is just a continuation of recommended, recommended screenings. And just so you know that most preventative care is covered by insurance. And although minorly inconvenient at times, it can save your life. Next slide. So know your risk and what you can do about it. There is no sure way to prevent every cancer. However, 40% of cancer deaths can easily be prevented by lifestyle changes such as not using tobacco in any form, healthy eating, exercising, and, um, et cetera. But most importantly, the biggest take home from this presentation is do not put off recommended screenings as it sure does save your life. Thanks so much. Thanks, Stephanie. So for our next segment, all our panelists will now join us on video.
So, so Jim, I, I actually have a couple of questions I'm going to ask your help with here uh, that showed up in the chat room. Um, the first one is, uh, what indicators are the medical community and science community looking to determine that this is as good as it gets? I guess it's a question of, like, at what point do we decide it's endemic rather than pandemic? Yeah, and that's a question that, that right now we just don't have an answer for. Um, you know, I would, I would use, in this case, I would use influenza as an analogy. Um, when do we, you know, in the medical profession, we have never decided that, in, that for influenza, this is as good as it gets. Um, we continue to try new technologies to help uh, limit uh, the spread of influenza. Um, vaccines are updated on a regular basis. And in fact, right now with the new technologies we use to develop the COVID-19 vaccines, we're using to develop those in terms of influenza. So from a medical standpoint, um, you know, I, I am never satisfied that this is as good as it gets. Um, none of us on this panel, I'm sure, want to see anybody who gets uh, any particular disease that could be prevented. Um, and certainly all of us are involved in ways that we can help treat people uh, if, they, if they were to get a particular disease. And so from that standpoint, I don't think we're ever going to get there. Um, but there will, there will be a time when, we, when hopefully we will see that these, these large spikes, these large surges that we're seeing around the world come down to a level where we're talking about that we can at least reliably predict over the next few months, if not the next year, about what trends will occur. And that's when I think endemic will happen. Um, you know, we've seen too many people, uh, particularly experts in the field, who have predicted this fall, this January, this May, uh, we will become endemic, and then a new variant occurs, and all of a sudden we're still talking about pandemic circumstances. So at this point, too early to tell, but from a medical standpoint, we'll never be satisfied until we don't have people dying from this disease. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to grab one more question from our audience here. Um, and this one I'm going to direct, Jim, to you from sort of a workforce management perspective. And then, Sue Ann, I'll ask you to weigh in more at the front line of where the practices are. And then I'll actually uh, weigh in initially to kind of give uh, sort of a system perspective as well. So here's the question for the three of us. What... What does the medical community plan to do to provide better availability and access to care for those who are trying to catch up with diagnosis or treatment of ongoing conditions? My experience has been that family members have been shrugged off and delayed due to practitioners' opinion of need and scheduling. I personally have had to wait six months to get to see a specialist for screening. And then a follow-up question by uh, an, a, another participant is, I would wonder how many of those practices are accepting new new patients, though. So I'm going to grab onto this first. So delay of care is obviously a main focus today here. Um, in our system, we're spending time looking at the data that's available to us to understand who would benefit most from engagement right away. So like I said uh, in the introductory comments, Four weeks makes a difference in a cancer patient's, uh, you know, outcomes. We we need to help people recognize this. We need to help people be educated about it. We need to make room for them in our schedules as well. And that's no easy task because we're all hearing about. Um, you know, the great resignation across the country that does overlap healthcare workers, that does overlap healthcare workers in our system as well. So from that point of view, we're trying to target people who would benefit most. We're not going to solve two years of a problem in the next six months for sure. And it is issues that we recognize and, and wrestle with. So Jim, from an incident command point of view, would you mind commenting a little further on that? Yeah, so this is actually a topic that we discuss regularly and in fact, yesterday had a meeting uh, almost exclusively devoted to this, uh, this particular aspect of things. Um, we are struggling with access. There's no doubt about that. And there's a number of factors for that. One is that uh, we see the same shortage of uh, workers that we see across all industries. Um, it is hard for us to recruit in those regards. And so that becomes a, a problem for us. Um, we have to have people in order to see people. Um, but we've also had other strategies, too, to put in place. So telehealth, and sort of, instead of having people come into the office, um, looking to try to automate things. Um, for uh, preventative care, many of our practices have switched to having a nurse lead um, annual wellness visits, particularly for our Medicare patients, rather than having them to see the, the, a provider in order then to allow the provider to focus in on some other things, because most preventative care can be taken care of um, at the nurse level. And so those are some things that we're working on to do that. Um, but then, of course, 
we're dealing with the backlog. They're trying to get through all of those patients that we had before. And so in order to try to do that um, across Northern Light Health, we have been expanding times, um, seeing people uh, at times when we hadn't done before. I'm happy to say that most of our endoscopy suites where we do colon cancer screening um, have been revved up so that we can do more of that and keep on top of those things. Um, but it's going to take us some time to dig out of the, the backlog that's developed over the last two years. Mm. Yeah, that, that's that's great insight, and and um, you know I think we all appreciate the innovative uh, approaches that is being taken. You know I think I would uh, ask our participants and all of our patients out there. Um, this is time for all of us to come together as a team and really work through this. You know we we understand there's limitations in resources and times, et cetera. Uh, let's just figure it all out. So Ann, if you could weigh in on that, you know, you oversee a number of practices and, and you're there, you know, pretty much on a daily basis, uh, seeing what people are dealing with. What's your view on all this? Yeah, I think <clears throat> Dr. Jarvis certainly hit a few things right on the head. It, telehealth has been huge for access. So um, being able to remote, you know, whether it's phone or video, we certainly prefer video. We love to see our patients on the screen to, to kind of get a sense of what's happening. But um, the ability to do that happened really quickly during COVID, and it was a very huge help um, in taking care of patients before we knew how to take care of patients safely in person. And we're still using that today for access. So recognizing that patients may not be able to miss work or commute, um, we're definitely trying to allow to offer telehealth for those patients that prefer that method. Um, and then as far as access goes, um, I can speak for Mercy and I would have to defer to you, Dr. Gilkey or um, our lady about uh, other parts of the state. But for Mercy, every primary care, there are seven primary care offices here in Cumberland County and they're all accepting new patients uh, with the exception of one office that is accepting. There's just about a four month wait. But um, the other six sites um, can get a new patient to be seen within 30 days as our, as our target typically. That gives us time to get your records and to make sure we have a good appointment with you the first time you're there. Great. Well, thank you so much for that insight. So uh, this next question is for um, Tom, Sue Ann, and Stephanie. Um, and, and it's an attempt to get down into your practice and really understand what you're seeing. Have you seen the, the delay of care in your practice during the pandemic? And if the answer is yes, about what percentage do you guess? And I'm trying to relate that to all the uh, higher level information we've shared with our audience earlier. So why don't we start with you, Tom? Uh, yes, uh, certainly uh, I, I have seen that. Um, the majority of, of my clinical practices, it takes place in the hospital. Uh, so I take care of mostly inpatients, you know, some of it being emergency kind of care. Um, but uh, it was drastic, uh, the, the reduction in, uh, you know, uh, procedures we were doing, patients we were seeing coming through for, you know, various you know, procedures like heart catheterizations. Um, it's better now, my sense is, uh, with, you know, presumably you know, large spread availability of vaccines, um, but it was it was pretty marked. You know, we, we would go days on end without taking care of a patient with a heart attack, which would be unusual. Um, so quite common. Hmm. So no, notable. So thanks, Stephanie. How about how about you? What have you seen in the uh, cancer care area? So um, over at Cancer Care, we actually have seen an influx in younger cancers, um, metastatic cancers coming through since um, regular screenings weren't done. Um, even delaying mammography by one year has been um, has shown an influx in cancers. Uh, we like I said, younger population of people with cancers as well. And I'd say probably a 10 to 20% influx in um, newly diagnosed cancers, but at a um, higher stage versus, um, you know, instead of catching it early, we've been seeing it stage three, four. Um, and it's been kind of scary. You know, we really want people to get those screenings. Excellent, thank you. So Ann, if you would uh, take it from uh, the primary care perspective. Sure, um, early on with the pandemic, um, at least 50% or more patients did not wanna come into the office. 
Um, and um, as we've worked through the pandemic and worked through changes with our waiting room, changes with our check-in, and really tried to make sure patients felt safe and that we could reduce any risk of any exposure to see the primary care provider, um, we've seen that uh, recovery. And so now uh, they're probably, you know, maybe one out of 10 patients that's still uncomfortable coming in um, or has hesitation to have a procedure done. And for those patients, we try to offer alternatives uh, like telehealth um, or even alternatives to some of the screening procedures that maybe they wouldn't consider before. So um, significant improvement recently. So, so let's talk a little bit more about that, that safety issue. I, I think that's top of mind for a lot of people. You know, to whatever degree people go to the supermarket, you know, there was a time we were seeing pretty much everyone had on their, um, their mask and people were walking in one direction. There were arrows on the floor. Over time, that seems to have loosened up. Uh, but I think from a healthcare facility point of view, people still think a lot about the safety factor. So, Suin, if you could help us see through your glasses, if you will, about safety in the uh, primary care practices and how, how's that handled amongst your staff? Sure, so primary care offices are challenged um, with, you know, one of the things that makes us love our jobs is that we see patients from birth to, uh, to end of life. Um, but that can be a big challenge when you're looking at something like a pandemic because if, a, if somebody calls your office because they have a, a new cough and a fever, um, you don't want them necessarily sitting in the waiting room next to a newborn or somebody who's getting cancer treatment. Um, so that some of the changes we made during the pandemic, we have um, been very consistent about and we continue to um, keep our patients six feet apart. Um, we also do far more triage for patients so that when you step in the door, we're being, you're being screened. And if you are acutely ill, you have a cough, a fever, then we're going to bring you right into an exam room. And so that limits the amount of people you're going to have contact with in the waiting room. It limits your interaction even with our front desk staff, and it allows us to take care of you in a, in a closed in situation kind of um, with limited exposure for others. So um, those are a couple of the features that we've done mm -hmm. uh, because of the pandemic that I expect we'll continue to do uh, to keep all of our patients safe and feel comfortable because that newborn coming in uh, for a two week weight check or a two month appointment is just as important for those parents to have the time they need um, and feel comfortable and safe talking with their primary care provider mm -hmm. as well. Great, thanks, very helpful. Tom, you, you have the opportunity to be in and out of uh, emergency departments uh, quite frequently. Um, I think in the cath lab, probably the care is the same as it always was because it's all, always a high degree. But could you, could you kind of help folks understand what it's like in the emergency department when you go in to see a, a patient who acutely is having a heart attack? Sure, sure. So um, I, I think one thing that has helped us um, immensely is just the widespread uh, availability of testing. So, you know, er, early in um, you know, the, the pandemic experience, uh, every person was a potential person of interest as they still are now, but you know, we, we maybe didn't have uh, as rapid ability and or widespread ability to test patients. So patients are routinely tested. They're, they're thought of as a quote unquote COVID, COVID positive patient until proven otherwise. We have adequate um, you know, equipment to take care of these folks. So, you know, cath lab staff uh, who are meeting these folks, you know, emergently and we have to act quickly are all uh, safe and protected. Excellent, thanks. So, so Stephanie, I know um, you know cancer patients are always concerned because a lot of the uh, treatments they get actually suppress their immune system, and they're at higher likelihood to get infections in the first place. So, you know, what's your observation uh, in terms of safety for the cancer patients? So, we actually have some great screeners. You know, every door has a screener. Um, radiation patients come in one door usually. Um, we also have the front door. This uh, they um, will take patients who are sick that are that have either been exposed or had COVID. Um, we have separate bays for those patients. Um, that makes it a lot easier. We also every single time that a patient comes in, we do wipe down the chairs before someone else sits in their seat. Um, masks, obviously. Um, temperatures as soon as they walk through the door through the screening process. All of that has been very helpful. Um, I think more cancer patients um, with the fact that we are using a new um, 
it's called um, Evusheld. It's a monoclonal um, shot that we've been giving to patients on top of the boosters that they've been receiving have also been very helpful for um, immune boosters so that they feel more confident coming into the clinic to get treatment. So there's a lot of things that are in the, um, in the works here, but we, we definitely try our hardest to always, you know, keep them safe and make them feel safe. So Evia Shield is that medication that actually is prior to getting uh, exposed to COVID-19. It can help you not actually get infected uh, because of the way it works. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. You know, Tom, this question is for you coming from our audience. Um, for individuals who are currently healthy, but have a history of heart issues, specifically MIs that have been successfully treated with stents, is getting a second booster recommended if under 65? So I think that's a question. Does that all add up to, you know, fitting the category of 50 and over uh, where a clinical risk factor is in place? I would think so. You know, a, a personal history of, of, of coronary artery disease or prior heart attack, um, I would encourage that patient. You know, I'd, I'd ask Dr. Jarvis to weigh in too, but yeah, that would be my sense. Mm -hmm. So second booster is Correct. what you're thinking. Um, Jim, doors open. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, again, everybody has an individual risk and, and individual discussions, but, uh, but I would put them in there. Um, you know, some of the data that we're seeing now uh, for people who, had, who have been infected with COVID uh, months ago now showing up with, with heart conditions, unre unlike uh, uh, heart attacks, um, is probably related to some damage done to the small blood vessels going into the heart during the initial infection that now are causing them to have issues. And so, you know, if you already have underlying heart disease, you don't want to have any exacerbation or worsening of that heart disease due to infection. And so anything you can do to prevent that infection is, is definitely recommended. Great, thanks. Okay, so that, that's helpful. Um, a comment here from uh, one of our participants uh, that they do a fantastic job at uh, CCOM. So that's Cancer Care of Maine, I presume, right? Okay. Um, I feel very safe there during my appointments. And uh, one of our participants uh, share that um, seeing the oncologist twice a year uh, it's very discouraging because those checkups lead to very high bills and they're not considered preventive. And the way uh, insurances are set up, um, they don't pay at 100% as preventive would, but rather they pay ongoing. And um, that is an issue about plan design. Um, so that comment is uh, well taken. Thank you for that. I'm going to ask another question here of. Um, Sue Ann, uh, about kind of, you, you deal with a lot of patients with the chronic diseases. You know, we mentioned how, you know, many people have one chronic and if not two or more. H have you been seeing the effect of the disease getting worse faster, like we were talking about on sort of a, a high level earlier? Are you seeing that, that, you know, people are not doing as well as they could have if they had been able to see you uh, more effectively? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one thing that comes to mind right away has been um, the pandemic and the lockdown. Um, and so, so many people's activity levels changed, their daily habits changed. Um, while well, you hear a few stories about people that really kind of embrace their time at home to kind of develop a new exercise routine or kind of a new healthy habit, um, what I see coming through my door actually are a lot of people that said um, they've been comfort eating more. They've gained a significant amount of weight during the pandemic. So we're seeing uh, diabetes getting worse um, because of uh, changes in, in eating habits um, and decrease in exercise. Um, and I would say that's true for other, um, uh, other chronic diseases like hypertension, um, which are directly related to kind of diet, exercise, um, and weight gain. So certainly seeing um, a lot of that. The other, you know, part that I would have to say has been um, mental health. So um, certainly seeing a lot of people that have struggled in one way. This, this pandemic has touched everybody. Um, so whether it's somebody that has uh, not done well with isolation, um, not done well with a change in their schedule, or been impacted by a loved one that's been affected by the illness, 
Um, the amount of people that really have struggled and have a lot of um, challenges because of the changes and the impact of COVID have been huge. Um, and it's something I think we're starting to see recognized more um, across all other um, areas like education with uh, teachers being educated about uh, changes that they're seeing. And um, so it's not just healthcare. I think when you said earlier about all of us being in this together, um, I think the mental health burden and uh, what everyone has been through um, has been a huge impact on, on our whole community and something that's gonna take all of us kind of working together um, to kind of push through and recover from. Mm, yeah, thank you for that. So uh, we're coming to the top of the hour. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question for all of our panelists. And if you think about your answer in terms of um, about a minute, from the perspective of your specialty, what last thought would you like to leave our audience with regarding why it is important for patients to get the care instead of delaying any longer? And uh, Tom, if I could start with you. Well, I would just you know stress to the audience that um, you know de delaying care, you know especially uh, acute care in, in you know heart health um, can can be catastrophic. It can lead to irreversible. Uh, conditions, it can impact quality of life uh, downstream. And I would just, you know, state that we're here and ready and willing to take care of you. Great. Hey, thanks, Tom. Steph? I'm in that unmute button. Anyway, <laughs> um, so obviously we want you to get the screenings. They're the first thing that puts, um, that prevents get it from having advanced diseases, um, advanced cancers. Uh, so, you know, with everything going on in the world, we are safe for you to get these done. We really think that it will delay mortality. Um, so really just get the screenings done. It's really important. Um, your insurance will pay 100% of preventative care um, and it will uh, lengthen your life if you do so. so that's a powerful statement. Sue Ann? From the primary care provider's um, perspective, I think you know our job is to help you navigate um, a, a high quality uh, of life and, and, and as long as possible. So uh, reach out to your primary care provider, um, get seen for your chronic disease so that that can be managed properly. Go in for a well visit uh, so that the screening test can be ordered. Um, and if you don't have a primary care provider, um, certainly, this is a great time to connect with one. Jim, I'll give you a chance to thank you, Sue Ann. Jim, I'll give you a chance to weigh in as well. I know you come at it from educating residents as well as uh, taking care of patients in family medicine yourself. Yeah, so I think uh, what everybody else said uh, is definitely spot on. And so um, what, I, what I would add to that is be persistent. So if you're having difficulty getting into a particular practice specialty or getting the care that you need, be persistent. Uh, one of the great things that Northern Light Health has been able to do during this pandemic is increase the ability and uh, avenues for patients to reach out to us. So we've just updated our patient portal. Um, it, it actually works very well for two-way communication between staff and, and providers and their patients. Um, and then we just launched a new app that actually also has a great way of you to keep track of your own health history, um, as well as communicate with your care team. And so I think those are great avenues. So be persistent if you're not getting what you need. Well, thank you for that, Jim. We've included some tools for you at the end of this presentation. Thank you all for joining us and thank you to our panelists. I hope this hour empowers you to take an active part in diminishing the impact this pandemic will have through causing delay of care. Let's talk about it and share information. Just a reminder, we will be emailing you a survey right after our conference. Please be sure to give us your feedback so we can continue to provide relevant information. Our next session will be on May 5th. We'll share the latest on COVID-19 and our focus will be on support for mental health in the workplace. We'll include information on how to get started and we'll share stories about the benefits of addressing mental health issues. We hope you will join us. We will send you the link for this session. We encourage you to share the invitation with your friends and colleagues. By working together to promote good health, we will be promoting good business. Thank you and have a good afternoon.